trust yourself and that that's loaded um because i know for some of us we can struggle to trust ourselves if we think we've made quote unquote bad decisions but you said it so eloquently earlier that from our mistakes there's so many learnings i know you didn't put it that way but that that's what i was hearing but to trust yourself like we we really have our sh- the strongest internal navigation system i personally think across all species Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Women Worldwide. Thank you so much for being here and for tuning in. It's a new week and another interesting entrepreneur who shares her journey and plenty of advice for you. I sat down with Yemi Penn, who is an engineer by profession. She's an entrepreneur, a speaker, an author, and a transformation mindset coach. And that was the focus of this week's episode all about transformation, feeling empowered, and the memo. Did you get the memo? Which is also the name of her book. And what's interesting is we have a choice to create our own memo. And that means to trust yourself, to be self-empowered, and be curious, and to show up and live your life. Or does it mean you're going to live by somebody else's memo. Yemi and I discuss trauma and what part trauma plays in the memo that you create. How do you start the memo creation process? And what does it really mean to be inspired and to transform? I could go on and on about Yemi, but I think it's time that you hear her story and her advice for you. Yemi, welcome. Welcome to Women Worldwide. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to see what we come up with. Yes, me too. Definitely, I've been reading so much about you. And I I find it really interesting that you're an engineer by profession. And you certainly chose being an entrepreneur because of your passion. And you're also a transformation mindset coach. Why did you choose this path? I was going to sound so cringy, but I think a lot of it chose me, to be really honest. This was not in the planning. I think I literally just put a post out on my social media that I never knew the different paths I've taken was even an option for a career or a mission. So the engineering was slight rebellion because my dad was a lawyer. And I think culturally there was this theory that, you know, if the first born didn't do his profession, the second needed. And I was the second born of his kids. Um, and I kind of rebelled against law because I was a bit bored. So <laughs> engineering was a little bit rebellious. It was also because I felt like doing stuff with my mind and my hands, the building. The entrepreneurship and thought leadership coaching um, was purely what's my purpose. Like there has to be more to life than go into the office for me personally and doing the nine to five. So definitely didn't plan this. That's amazing. And I, I do find that some of the greatest things that we do in life and when we find this incredible purpose, it's not planned. It just happens. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the universe lines certain things up for you. And if you're open to it, you can take it. So Mm -hmm. I know that as I was reading about you, I read something about the memo, Mm -hmm. being empowered, transforming, creating your own memo, what exactly does that mean? And, and how do you help people do that? Yeah, if I, if I go very briefly back to the, the source of this memo was when I relocated to Australia. I had lived in Japan, the UK, so there was a lot of dutting around and, and on paper it looked like I was running away. Shame was a big part of my own personal story. But when I got to Australia eight years ago, I remember speaking to a coach and just saying, look, I tried. I had, I, I was on the in the process of getting divorced. I had two kids, two different dads. Just the, the general social setting, I hadn't, I hadn't lived up to. And I remember saying to this coach, I didn't get the memo. Did did you the memo that was going to give me the clear layout of how to live life and how to have a happy marriage and get that great job and get the promotions and 
you know, just saying because I'm, I'm, I thought I was failing miserably. And that really became, it kind of stuck with me. So I would ask people, did, did you get the memo? Because I need to know where you got it from because I didn't get it. And that literally has, has genuinely become a big foundation of my work, which is, well, can we acknowledge that there isn't one memo for everybody? that some of us may not get it because depending on where we sit in this world, because we, we still live in a very unequal world. And how about we take our power back and start creating our own, which fundamentally is a blueprint. We all were born with the blueprint. I think mm. we can investigate as to whether it still works for us. If it doesn't recreate it, like really break and bend some rules on, on the premise you, you stay within the confines of legalities. But most of the rules that we are working to our own I have to put that small print in because some people go completely <laughs> completely over but bend some rules bend some rules and recreate the memo that you've written for yourself that that's one of my biggest messages in most of my work I think that's a really important message sometimes I feel like and even if I look at my own journey or um, talking with friends or peers there's a memo and they got it but it was never their memo and I yeah. think that's what you're speaking to, that there's so much around us as we're shaped in this world and we find our path. And sometimes if you don't really step back and think about the choices you make or feel empowered, you're living somebody else's memo. And then one day you wake up. It's never, yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's ever too late. Do you, do you think it's ever too late to, never. to make your own mm. memo? Never. My goodness. I mean, I'm not there yet, but I'm sure there are people out there who are in their 70s, 80s and realize, I mean, I'm speaking to a lady now in her 80s. She she worked on the, the one of the first Star Trek episodes and you can see her now in her 80s, her brain saying, oh, my goodness, I should have written this book ages ago. And she's oh, written her first book. So it's never, ever, ever too late. And I think that's what stops a lot of people is that once again, you've either adopted a rule that said, in order to make a difference, you needed to have started when you were 20. And hey, I, I call BS on that. It's, it's, it's not. It really, no. it really isn't. Yeah. Well, I'm going to call it's BS funny. too, because I've, I've heard far too many 20-somethings recently say, I've only got so much time. I've got to do this by the time I'm 30. And you know, whether it's be somewhere in their profession or I have to be married or I need kids. Mm. No, no. That that definitely could be somebody else's memo or some kind of pressure right. that you think yeah. you're uh, or you're aspiring to be. Do you think that a lot of our own memo building is based on some kind of trauma, some kind of oh. big event? Oh, such a juicy question. <laughs> I, I, I think it's definitely you know, I'm very visual. So as you say that, I just think we've created something. It's kind of around it. So it doesn't mean it's completely owned by it, but it's kind of factored around it. I think we all have our belief systems, which this is one way of which we get belief systems, which stems from your environment and how you grew up. But somewhere in that environment, trauma has most likely happened. I mean, I'm literally, I'm currently doing my PhD, which isn't in my bio yet, on trauma. And my research oh. is showing the stats are high, more than 70%, and have experienced at least one traumatic incident. And that was pre-2020. That was pre the pandemic. So you can only imagine that that figure has gone up. Yes. So for most of us in our everyday environment, trauma has happened and that skews it. So it, there's so many complexities into who we are as human beings. And so for some people, if something bad happened, say they worked in an environment, it was really bad. Uh, I don't know. I, I had a gentleman who, as an engineer, he worked out on site and a young, a young guy sadly passed away because he hit some electrical wires oh, no. and sadly passed that way. However, this manager who was manager has been so shaken up by it that he's actually, he appears aggressive at work. Oh. If you do work and it's not to the standard and it's potentially going to impact safety, even though it might not be a high risk like safety, he absolutely loses it and you can get it. So he's, he's created a memo that says, I must be harsh on everybody right. that does something because of that. Hyper and you can vigilant. empathize with it. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. Hyper vigilant. So without a shadow of a doubt, but the layers are so complex. I don't even think, I don't even think it's on the United Nations radar as to how much of an epidemic um, trauma is. 
the same mental health. I think right. the trauma is the underlying thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, great question. But as you can see, I get very animated because well, I love I'm it this to be at the forefront. I love your animation and your passion. And I, I do remember, this is just interesting from a, another interview that I did with, I believe her name is Jude Burke and she's the author of The Millionaire Mystique. And her book is really interesting because it, her study was all about millionaires. And I think she interviewed over 300 millionaires and to find out that most of them had two or three traumas in their lives. Yes. Isn't that unbelievable? Yes, I'm, I'm so, I've got goosebumps all over me. I'm so glad you said that because I have that innate feeling that trauma has a lot, especially, especially with the billionaires we have in the world. Oh gosh. And, and it's, not to, it's not to minimize them by any means. No, no, no. But, but my wonder always is, but has that been looked at? Has the trauma been looked at? Has it been nurtured? Has it been cleaned? just so that they can be even better. When I released my documentary on trauma, um, I actually had a lot of very wealthy men reach out to me and say, oh my gosh, that happened to me. Oh, and there, and there, was that same, there was that same synergy that there seemed to be trauma attached to it, but they carried a lot of wealth. And one was able to very openly say that he believes he's built his wealth to protect him so that that would never happen to him again or anyone else. Is your documentary out now or is it coming out? It, it is. So I've currently got two out, but the one that has really shot was the first one. It's titled "Did I Choose My Trauma?" and that's on YouTube. So okay. I wanted to make that available to everybody, but um, yeah, currently speak, speaking to a few platforms to release my third one. Well, congratulations! That is amazing. Let's let's take it back to the memo and your own memo, creating it. If somebody wants to start this transformation process because it is definitely transformation how do you start if you recognize that you need to feel more empowered or passionate or change something what would you do how, how would you even know where to begin I know it's a hard question uh, it, it feels really easy I get these downloads it feels easy now if you asked me about three months ago I'd have been all over I think listen <laughs> to the signs listen to the signs and that sounds so Woo woo. So let me break it down with my engineering brain. Okay. The body by this guy wrote a book, Bessel van der Kolk. It's titled The Body Keeps the Score. Your body most of the time will tell you. If you are a physical person, your body will tell you when you are uncomfortable with something. Mm -hmm. And just listen to those signs. For me, I've got a weak rotator cuff, my shoulder injury. When something's bothering me, it hurts a lot more. Like, just listen to the signs in your body. It's not to suggest that it's something else. Yes, that injury came about, you know, maybe from childbirth, pelvic, but it gets, it's significantly more sensitive to stress, discomfort. And then there's radical honesty. Listen to the signs and then get radically honest with yourself. What is going on? But because we're so busy, we don't have the time to get really curious with asking yourself questions. Like why? So when that happens, why is that happening? Oh, it's because I'm about to go on stage and I'm nervous. Oh, but why are you nervous? Oh, because people might judge me. Why might they judge me? Because I've judged other people in the past. So my radical honesty is pretty like quick, 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 because I like to see results really quickly. But if people are looking for transformation, first of all, find the discomfort because there's discomfort and then you just need to find out why. Now you know why you're significantly more open to figuring out what you need to do about it. But most people don't know why or where to start. Start there. That's a really good place to start because first of all, I, I analyze body language. Your body leaks out your stress. Your body leaks out your discomfort. So I do think it's particularly hard for people to tune into themselves. Yeah. And I I definitely work very hard at the meditation, the breathing, the calming exercises before I do anything, before I come on Women Worldwide, before I go on a TV interview, step out on stage, anything. But it is harder and harder to do that because of all of the distractions around us. And that's the same thing with what you're saying. There's so many distractions that sometimes you don't read your body signals. And I think that a lot of if you're aware of it, you can also heal yeah. and rest and do what you yeah. need to do. So that's really interesting that you said that. Let's talk about your book, because that is all about 
the memo. And mm. the name of your book is Did You Get the Memo? And it's been out for how long? When, when two years, just over two years now. That's really exciting. So congratulations on that. And what did you want people to walk away with? What, what is that big underlying message for readers? Yeah, I've just recently worked on my position and, and this, this really encompasses almost everything I do. But that book, without knowing the language then, is to awaken the rebellious curiosity in them. That's what did you get the memos about? Yes, it's partly my story and storytelling has always been powerful, but I probe with questions. You know, the book covers some, some of the really strong pinnacles of life. I talk about money, but rather than just talk about money, I talk about the genetics of money. Ooh. What is your money story and how is it tied to your DNA? So I share parts of mine and how it showed up in me where I went from making a humble income to then you know, multiplying that by 20 and, and bringing in way more than I ever knew what to do with. My genetics said, mm -mm, we don't know what to do with this money. And so I would create bills to waste the money. Right. And so I ask them, what is your money story? And that is the questions. And then kind of probe them to say, okay, what do you want to do differently? What do you want to do differently that goes against the grain, that challenges status quo? And, and that's really what that book does. A very, a very light introduction um, being my first book but obviously I do a lot more work after that for people to probe deeper and get the results they want. This sounds really interesting I've, I've never ever heard anything like the genetics of money yeah. which is yeah. fascinating because I think we're all shaped in certain yeah. ways and you you have a energy relationship almost yeah. with currency and and the value you bring and the currency that comes in but it oh. it stems deeper than that it goes back to your childhood how you're framed how you're shaped that is fascinating as you you know you've been getting your book out there are you noticing is certain types of readers or more more women more more men younger audiences yeah. or does it attract millennials or or, or gen yeah. z it's really fascinating. It's a, it's a, it's a big mix. And, and this has only been proven. You, you mentioned earlier, you know, when I think of the big four consultancy, so PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, mm -hmm. I got that right, here in Australia, I did an amazing event for them. I mean, profound, definitely groundbreaking on this side of, of the hemisphere, where they took about 3,000 their staff members to a residential and they, they basically exposed them to things they would never do in the office, sound healing, you know, indigenous dancing, basket weaving, looking at their inner child. And what I realized is that the percentage of people who are interested in challenging the memo or knowing more about the memo was almost 40% men, 40% women. And then we had if I got my math right, 20%, kind of like non-binary, like the mm -hmm. LGBTQI. Like, yeah. I, and I, I need to differentiate that partly because we've, we think we've been existing in this binary world. But my work of this rebellious curiosity really has people questioning. And the age really does range from the 20s to, to the 60s. Wow. Um, and, and that, I guess that still blows my mind because in setting up you know the thought leadership part of my business I was always advised to go in for a niche a niche which I get but because I really have this kind of split balance between masculine and feminine energy and I think my engineering brings that masculine and I've right. lived in this world for 40 years men literally peek behind the curtain and say what is she talking about and <laughs> why am I resonating with this um and I love it I, I, love I really that. do so it's yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a split. That, that is fantastic. So talk a little bit about um, just your thoughts on, you, you said that there's a lot of different people coming to you and different ages. If you were to step back, do you think more people are not getting the memo? So there's a, a much greater pool of people who are doing something, but it's somebody else's yeah. memo. Oh, 100 percent. And um, <laughs> if I was to take off my judgmental lens, which, you know, and I, I do like to call myself out with love and compassion on, on judging, because I think most of us do it if we're going to be honest. With of ourselves. course, we all do. Um, I, I think a lot. I think a lot are living according to somebody else's memo. Right. And I, I see it in the conversations. 
However, I'm not one of the coaches or thought leaders who thinks it's necessarily my job to point it out to them. I ask questions and I say, stay curious. Because there's a part of me, because even if I was to go and superimpose my thoughts, once again, I'm giving them my memo. Right. It's not even there. So I'm, I'm always very cautious, especially when I get up on stage of what I say. I say, look, I'm going to share some things with you mm-hmm. and I want you to consider it. Um, but for them, I think because if they always will look into that tutor to that teacher, then there's this dependency, codependency. And then again, they're just listening to their coach's memo. But definitely, I think there are a lot, you can hear it in the language. And the time will come, just like it did with me, that I'm like, oh, this isn't mine. My, my biggest fear, and maybe message to other people is, I'm okay with failing. I'm okay with making mistakes, but I definitely don't want to do it following someone else's memo. That, that just, that crushes me. I would rather fail on my own memo, my own blueprint. That's, Absolutely. That's big for me. And I, yeah, I, I like to share that as well. Right. Because if, as long as it's your own, you can truly learn from it. And, and every failure is your greatest opportunity. It's what you do with it. So I think that that's really important. What do you think it is that keeps you motivated, inspired? I mean, I've already, we know you're an entrepreneur. We know you're on stage. You're getting your PhD. You're a transformation mindset coach. How do you keep this all going? What's the inspiration behind it? Mm, I've just finished reading Viktor Frankl's Men's Search for Meaning. Oh, I and didn't read that. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I've heard of it a, decades ago, but only just listened to the audible again. And in hearing it, I have to admit that what keeps me going is just giving my life meaning. Because when I look at the world and some of the things that we experience or go through, it's exhausting. And so I come back to meaning. Meaning. How can I, how can I have more meaning in my life? And for me, meaning comes from joy. So if I see someone smile or my kids make me laugh, then that's, that's meaning. And I keep on going, but then I've gotten better at letting things go. You know, the entrepreneurship part of me is still there, but I've started to let go of my businesses because, I think it's, it's fulfilled the need it needed to do. I don't need to hold on to it forever. I, I felt I needed to because I felt that's where my success and my name and my brand came from. But I've, I've now found out that I don't. And some of my businesses have failed. Right. And that's, that's okay. So it, it's, it's all meaning. That's what keeps me going. But I'm learning to reduce the noise. Like Also, for me personally, I think I'm one of those people that used to have to keep busy to manage trauma. But it ha- and then it was useful at some stage, but it's not anymore because I'm getting older and I'm getting tired and I want my brain to do the sharp things. So I started to let things go as well. That helps a lot. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And speaking of finding the meaning and managing everything, how do you balance? So you're very calm. You're extremely poised. You have so much going on. How do you keep it all together? Are you meditating? What, what do you do? <laughs> How do you balance life and or, or blend life and uh, work, whatever you want to call it? Um, I am meditating, but not as religiously as I should or, you know, steadfastly as I should. Um, what am I also, I'm also, um, ah, there was a word that just left me. I'm also very kind to myself. You know, I really gift myself like every now and again, if I can afford it, I would go on weekends. There was a time whereby for every six weeks, I would just take a weekend and go to a hotel. So I gift myself this compassion. That was it. I also bend my rules a lot. I bend my rules. I used to have a rule, yummy, I want you to cook a healthy meal for the kids every day. And that was just killing me. I mean, yeah, it was a desire to be the greatest mum, but I couldn't. I bent my rules. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, I had somebody else cook. Can I buy the food? Another thing I do is I outsource as much as I can. Yes. I, I am not I am not attached to getting labels of certain things. I'm really not. Whether it's a gardener, a cleaner, babysitting. I think the only thing I haven't outsourced in my life is childbirth. But outside of that, <laughs> right. everything. <laughs> <laughs> Everything and, and can be outsourced. Helps. Yes, exactly. Well, it, it's clear that what you share with the people who work with you, you do for yourself. This kindness, the compassion, the bending the rules. It is. It's really important. Well, I can't even believe that we're at the time in our discussion when I'm going to ask you to give 
parting advice. You've given a ton of advice already, but what can you share with the Women Worldwide Network about feeling more empowered and making those steps toward transformation? The first thing I want to say is to, to trust yourself. And that's, that's loaded. Um, because I know for some of us, we can struggle to trust ourselves if we think we've made quote unquote bad decisions. But you said it so eloquently earlier that from our mistakes, there's so many learnings. I know you didn't put it that way, but that, that's what I was hearing. But to trust yourself, like we, we really have our, the strongest internal navigation system, I personally think, across all species. <laughs> to be really honest, and that's so Listen, bold. <laughs> listen to really ourselves. Think, yeah, yes. Like really. And, and if that means you've got to do some work as, because you feel, you know, you failed or something, do the work. But come back to that internal navigation system. You've, you've got it in you. Um, please. I love it. Well, trust yourself, listen to that strong navigation system and do the work. Excellent, excellent advice. Yemi, where can people find out more about you and your work and your book and your documentary? Where, where do you want to send them? Well, definitely my website. So it's just www.yemipen.com. And the social media, if you want the closest to who I am, which is a mix of goofy and intelligent, then Instagram, yemi.pen. Um, but I'm also on LinkedIn. So I definitely love to, to share my thoughts across those platforms. But to be up to date, definitely my website and subscribe. That way you get all the information. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of your advice, your time, and just sharing your, your journey and so many insights with us. So thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much, Deidre. Thank you. You're welcome. And a big thank you to all of you for tuning into Women Worldwide. You know what I always say, keep the conversations going and the feedback coming. And you know where to find me. I am on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter. I'm at Deep Breckenridge. Okay, friends, until our next episode, stay focused, energized, and feeling empowered. Thank you. <laughs>